Welcome to the Visual Art Forums. Uh, this is the second to last Visual Art Forums for this semester. And I just want to remind everyone that the last one will be on March 30th. We'll be having Shannon Stratton, who's the director curator of Three Walls in Chicago. It's also at 6 p.m. here in the lecture hall. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone, and I'm going to pass this over to Kate Rimmer to introduce our um, next O'Dane Distinguished Artist in Residence, um, and Mi Lee, who is going to do a talk for this evening. So please join me in welcoming Kate Rimmer. Thanks. She's so special, she needs two people to introduce her. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Anne, my, Anne Mi Lee, sorry, uh, our uh, Dane Distinguished Visiting Artist. Uh, before I do, though, I'd like to invite everyone to a reception after the talk at the Charles Scott Gallery. Uh, Anne Mee was born in Saigon and fled to the US with her family at the end of the Vietnam War. Growing out of that experience, Anne Mee's photographic work is centered on the realities and fictions of war and the military. She has trained her camera on reenactments of battles from the Vietnam War in works such as Small, Small Wars and 29 Palms. And more recently, she's been photographing US military installations around the world. Anne Mee has a BAS and an MS from Stanford University and an MFA from Yale. She has taught at Bard since 1998. Anne Mee's work has been shown at numerous galleries throughout the world and is in prestigious collections such as the Guggenheim, MoMA, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Whitney. Please welcome Anne Mee Lee. Great. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, thank you for having invited me to Vancouver, and I'm so looking forward to uh, uh, starting my residency this summer. Um, Vancouver has a great tradition, um, a photographic tradition, with all these wonderful um, artists uh, working here, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I just uh, finished this uh, project that took me about nine years. Am I standing in the right place? Okay. That took me about nine years, and... Um, uh, I completed a book that was published um, um, at the end of the fall last year. And so I feel so free and have been sort of going back and looking at different projects and throwing around ideas for new projects. Um, and um, I sort of feel like I can do anything, which I think is a mistake, because one cannot, as an artist, one cannot do just about anything. But that's the way I feel. Um, I, I think the other important um, uh, consequences of having finished this project also has made me look at um, how um, permeable the walls between the projects that I always felt were so structured actually are. And so I sort of put together a bunch of slides to kind of uh, show you a little bit where my mind is right now, and it's kind of like all over the place. Um, these are pictures of Haitsu City, and um, I was asked to give a lecture at DIA a few years back, and I chose to do it on his work. Um, I've always been fascinated by a lot of the land art, and his in particular, and um, I found his very evocative in relationship to um, the work that the, um, uh, the military, the CBs, did in Vietnam, constructing um, um, flight lines and uh, trenches and all sorts of other military installations. Um, I found a visual and also um, contextual similarity. Um, these are some more um, GIs during the Vietnam War. Um, and this is Heitzer and some of the work by the Seabees. Um, this is the entrance to the Kuchi Tunnel in um, southern Vietnam, and it was a, a network of these very intricate tunnels that the Viet Cong built to uh, wage a war underground um, during the Vietnam War. And uh, this is a bit of a drawing. And, um, and these are very recent pictures, and I just took these with my cell phone because I just got my contact sheets back last week. Um, this was kind of a gift. I was invited by this Hollywood director to come down and photograph on the set of this uh, Civil War film that he uh, was filming outside of New Orleans. And you can see trenches and uh, um, so something very connected to um, some of the images I'd shown before. Um, 
an image from the press, um, napalm um, in Vietnam, and uh, more pictures from the set that I took. Um, another picture from the set. Um, Heitzer. Um, something else that I've been working on is this um, uh, a porn film that I found, uh, uh, one of the rare ones, and I won't go too much in detail because uh, there's some young children sitting here. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very unusual film. I, I don't know exactly when it was made, but it's happening in the landscape, and, and the setting is, is actually quite incredible. So it's a recreation of a Vietnamese village. Um, and the unspeakable acts that are going to happen. And so um, I've been looking at them and trying to transform them and incorporate them in my work. Um, this is Larry Burroughs. Uh, more pictures from the film set, and I have some much more gory ones. Um, and then uh, from that porn film as well. Um, a picture I made of a reenactor, a Vietnam War reenactor. Um, this is from the porn. And this is from a real Marine. So, so um, I think where my head is is that it's all a mix and it's all interchangeable, whether we're talking about reenactment, whether we're talking about Hollywood, whether we're talking about uh, the Marines and the Navy training for war or even um, being at war. Uh, the, and it's also called theater of war. Um, I have been in the Gulf and photographed that. So, so it's all a big mess. Um, and uh, I think my work has tried to make sense out of it. And after having finished um, all these projects, I, I just realized that it's really all coming together in an interesting and evocative way. Um, so now I'll go back uh, chronologically and, and talk about the different projects. Um, I, um, like Kate mentioned, I was born in Vietnam and um, in 1960, I was 15 when the war ended. And pretty much I would say that my entire younger life was determined by um, the conflict in Vietnam and by American foreign policy. And um, I think that so much of my work has been to try to make sense out of that. Um, none of these projects were ever planned with the idea of um, them each being a puzzle and a master plan. Um, I, I think I was interested in one single idea and just pursued it. And once I finished it, moved on to the next one that seemed somewhat uh, to make sense. I think ultimately, in the end, um, they all work together. There are three bodies of work in black and white. Uh, the first one was made in Vietnam when I was able to return um, to Vietnam in the mid-1990s when uh, relationships with Vietnam were normalized. Um, and so for a Vietnamese American, it was safe to return home. The second body of work uh, was uh, an exploration of these young men that I discovered who reenacted the Vietnam War. And the third one is about um, the Marine Corps training in 29 Palms. So um, in their own way, historically, um, in terms of um, this play between uh, fiction and training, um, they all sort of talk to each other about uh, memories of war, about training for war, and about readiness for war. And, and um, I think also morally, whether we are prepared to, to deal with uh, the consequences of war. Um, but um, they were really started out as very single projects. So this is Vietnam. Um, I um, had just come out of graduate school and um, uh, wasn't quite um, ready to think of myself as a landscape photographer, which is the way I see myself now. Um, I had been pushed in graduate school to do work that was more biographical. You know, where are you in the pictures? You know, um, I did not come from a very arty background. I, um, I studied sciences and discovered photography by chance. And so as soon as I hit the ground in Vietnam, I, I realized that I wanted to sort of make tangible all this idea that I'd had of what it would have been like to have had an uninterrupted and somewhat peaceful childhood. I wanted to reconnect with um, uh, stories I heard living in exile about uh, life in Vietnam. I wanted to hear about the landscape. Um, and I started making these pictures that had so much to do with scale. Um, for me, scale is extremely important. It is... Um, I think people change, you know, buildings get torn down, but the landscape and the idea of scale is something that uh, endures forever. Um, I think that uh, 
the landscape has been fascinating to artists for many years because it is a place where um, it's a fascinating place to 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 have a dialogue between culture, history. Um, there's a certain incredible dynamic between um, the wilderness and and um, human endeavor, and I think it all. Um, gets displayed within uh, an, a sense of scale. And, and that's what I realized that I could do um, as a photographer. Um, I had been working with a large format camera also, and um, I realized that uh, the larger negative, and I use five by seven negative, provides the kind of details and the sense of space and the sense of physicality in a large print that was very important to, to um, convey this sense of scale and this sense of something greater than us that survives beyond a war, beyond any kind of destruction. Um, I was so thrilled when I made this picture and it was in the delta of the Mekong. Um, I had seen pictures of um, helicopters, like you did, uh, landing in the rice fields and uh, wounded being evacuated, but I was never really able to go into um, the delta because it was, uh, because of the fierce fighting that took place, so it was not very safe. And so it was a real first um, uh, connection for me. And, and um, so I made this picture, and it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a fictional family, too, um, that I put together. Um, I photographed a lot of um, soccer games. You know, I, I grew up playing soccer in Vietnam. Um, there are a lot of pictures of children as well. Um, but the landscape was uh, what really um, uh, took my breath away. I, um, I went to Vietnam um, every year for about four or five years and would spend a month or up to three months there. And uh, the project, you know, um, went on for quite a long time. I'm, I'm a pretty slow worker. And towards the end, I think I, I got um, very frustrated with making the same kind of pictures and I started um, making pictures that were more ambiguous. I w actually went to the DMZ, and obviously up until then I sort of ignored the issue of war, and, and it was sort of the big elephant in the room. So I went to the D DMZ and photographed things that, that could be taken for war. So this is a slash and burn in, um, on an agricultural practice. Um, and I made a number of pictures like that. And I returned home and I processed all that work and edited it and, and felt that it was finished. Um, and then I heard about these young men uh, who reenact the Vietnam War. And uh, I, I felt that it was such a great opportunity to maybe try to go down and, and figure out uh, um, what to do with them and explore the past and explore this idea of the Vietnam War, finally. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I would find. Um, so I contacted these guys and, and they invited me down. It was all by invitation. It's happening in, Carol in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and so this is what I found. And these guys are very conservative guys who um, perhaps missed a calling in the military. Uh, perhaps uh, they had a father who distinguished themselves in combat in Vietnam. Perhaps they lost a much older brother. And, and they sort of came together to exchange a lot of things they collected to try to have some kind of virtual experience. Um, they were incredibly rigorous in, in, in what they wore, how they recreated things. Um, the conditions for my being invited was that I would have to be in character. And uh, they gave me a, a number of choices. They gave me, well, you could be a combat photographer, you could be a North Vietnamese um, soldier, you could be a Viet Cong, you could be a nurse. And I, I asked them, well, what would give me the most flexibility in terms of moving back and forth? And they said, well, be a Viet Cong, and then you're captured, and then you can go on the other side and turn coat. And I said, all right. <laughs> um, so they made me order Vietnamese-made pajamas. Um, um, my husband couldn't come, so I had my girlfriend, who's a photographer, come, and she's blonde, and we both had black pajamas. Uh, I have to say, when I put on the pajamas, it was um, a, a very disturbing moment, but uh, 
you know, you do what you do, what you got to do to make the pictures. And so um, here we are, and the hut back there is where we slept the first night. And this is sort of a, a spontaneous camp for the um, Viet Cong and the Vietnamese army. The GIs are up on the hill, and uh, it, it mirrors the, the reality of the war when you think about it. Um, the guys who were more fit and, and had less of a budget would be um, North Vietnamese soldiers or Viet Cong because the um, uniform cost less and you could improvise and you wore desert boots and the SKS guns cost less. And then the guys who had more money and were not necessarily as well fit because they're up on the hill and we ambushed them. Um, and they had air mattresses, you know, and the, uh, the guns are more expensive and everything's more expensive. So, so it, it's interesting. Um, they don't keep track of who killed who, but they have these kind of loose scenarios. And um, they, they used me as, as part of the scenario, as the part of the surprise. So sometimes I'd come out of a jar, uh, a rice, behind a rice, a jar and, and ambush somebody or, or um, it, was, it was pretty creepy and, and intense. Um, this is me. Um, these are all snapshots that I made on one of the first um, um, event before I could figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And this is a real, of course, of Viet Cong. Um, much more confidence and more continence. Um, I think we all know this picture and these guys reenact it and I quickly real and I made the picture of course, how could you not? And I quickly realized that I didn't really want to recreate the horror of war because what was the point? Uh, I had uh, lived through some of it and I, I sort of carried um, I think the, the guilt and the, the, the difficulty of it, the horror of it. Um, and I, I thought, well, what else could you explore? And, and I think the landscape was always interesting to me, the landscape of strategy. Um, that's something I always heard. I heard about the terrain in Vietnam and how treacherous and how unprepared Americans were, so I wanted to look at that. Um, I also wanted to look at um, this idea of these young men reenacting. And, and I, I remember still going to any bookstore and seeing you know, this incredible cultural shelf of books on the Vietnam War um, and thinking about how the myth of the war, the myth of the country uh, was still so unresolved and so huge in, in um, Americans' cultural imagination. And that would be interesting to explore. Um, I also, from the previous picture, I, I, um, I made a print, and this is from a six by nine negative, I think, or six seven, I can't remember. I think it's a six nine. I quickly realized it, it just didn't have the quality, the physical presence of a large format negative. And so I decided that I, I should try my best to um, continue with a large format camera. And I think it's important, and you guys, most of your students here, to consider your tools every time you start a new project. And, um, you know, it made me very nervous to try to go down there and run after these guys with a large format camera, but I quickly remembered that, um, you know, Timothy O'Sullivan photographed the Civil War and uh, Barnard and, and, and all of those guys um, photographed the Civil War. And of course, you can go back to Le Gray, who photographed the maneuvers uh, for Napoleon. Um, they did it, and, and so I could do it. And um, I, think, I think I also got really um, encouraged by the fact that they photograph before the event and they photograph after the event. It's not always necessary to be in the heat of the action. And um, that kind of work can um, give you a, a, a physical a distance that is, could also be an intellectual distance that, that could be interesting. And so these are the pictures. Um, and, and of course I quickly realized that uh, the landscape was also an important character. Now you have Vietnam in North Carolina and Virginia, and uh, uh, that transformation is, is so great. Um, having grown up watching, um, or in college watching the Vietnam War movies, I, I also realized that uh, um, often they were not shot in Vietnam. You know, Apocalypse Now was shot in the Philippines. Uh, many movies are shot in um, Malaysia. I, I could tell from the color of the grass uh, or the rice field, I could tell from um, full metal jacket that the palm trees were the wrong palm trees because they came from North Africa and he was also shot in the studio. So that idea of the landscape as character in film, in reenactments was uh, uh, very provocative for me. Uh, the transformation of the landscape. Um, 
this is a field with grazing cows and the next day it was uh, perfect to become a landing zone and all you had to do was uh, crack a can of smoke. And it was, uh, from what I was told by my military advisor, I'll tell you the story later, um, it was perfect for a landing zone. Um, these guys grew bamboo on, on the land to, to give um, uh, the location more authenticity. Um, they learned how to pose from watching movies. Um, the smoking um, and, and all of that. And it's so interesting watching um, the more recent movies of, um, uh, of the Gulf War and realizing, and also you know, from, from after spending more time with the military guys, to realize that they also get their inspiration before they go to war from watching uh, Hollywood films. Uh, this is one of the more intricate pictures, and it's a Vietnam era jet that these guys were um, spending the weekend reenacting with. Um, I was not able to take any pictures, so I made them come back uh, on another weekend. And this is a, a process that I developed working with them um, that I needed to kind of stop them and, and, and get their attention to, and the, the time to be able to set up a picture. Um, I, was, um, I was a little disturbed at first by how kind of phony those guys look at first. You know, I think before I decided that it was important to, to make the point that this is a reenactment. And I remember Jeff, Jeff Wall actually came to Bard to give a lecture, and, and I've been teaching at Bard for a while. And um, he asked me what I was working on, and I told him about these. And I said, you know, it annoys me so much because they just don't look real, and I just don't know what to do. They don't give me the time. They don't give me the attention. And he said, well, you should start paying them and, 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 <laughs> and then make them rehearse. And, and, you know, of course, he explained the whole thing. And, and I considered it seriously, but then I quickly realized that if I did that and there won't be that sort of tension, that fakeness, then it would take away from the fact that um, I wanted to speak about this culture of reenacting. Um, the night battles was what came closest to, to what I experienced um, during the war. And um, I think I used to say um, until fairly recently that I didn't really care about the performative aspect of, of my work in some of these pictures. You know, I'm the sniper and I'm in the next picture. Uh, it was really out of um, uh, utility that I, I, I placed myself in the picture because there were no other Asian women uh, around. Um, but to be honest, I, I actually really enjoyed um, um, participating and, and um, having some, this kind of control and being able to shoot at this, those guys. Um, and this is me and the special force guy uh, after I have um, been captured and turned coat and became a Kit Carson scout, so I'm teaching him Vietnamese. And this idea of the beauty in war and, and maybe a bit of romance in war is something that um, is not often spoken about, too. Um, as I was finishing that and getting a little um, frustrated with working with these guys, um, we um, built up our, the invasion to Iraq and, and in March of 2003, when we invaded Iraq, um, I, I became extremely anxious about uh, the situation, thinking about the young men and women who were going to be shipped to war and thinking about the effect of war on their lives and on their family lives and on their community. Um, I immediately thought that I should become an embed and, and go to Iraq, um, but it was way too late. And as I was doing my research and I um, got on the wait list to be an embed, I came across pictures of the Marines training outside of Los Angeles um, near Joshua Tree in a place called 29 Palms. And um, I contacted the base and um, was uh, invited to come and photograph one of the exercises. Um, I, I, I thought it was just perfect, you know, after Vietnam in um, Virginia, why not uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, outside of LA? Um, it was quite um, a feat to, to um, get the people in charge of training to invite me back multiple times. Um, I was able to go um, quite a number of times per year for two or three years. Um, I think the fact that the pictures were 
in black and white, um, the pictures were also large and full of details and look more like art made them uh, more open to, to my frequent visits. Um, these pictures um, sort of, um, I think, pushed me further in my exploration of the landscape um, in relationship to uh, military activity. I think um, um, it's a great site for contemplation, this kind of militarized landscape. I think that um, without the action, without um, the immediate destruction that you see in pictures of war that are shown on the front line um, newspapers, um, you, you can step back and you can consider other things, you know. I mean, I think that the scale here uh, makes you think about toys. It makes you think about um, a force that's much greater than us that looms over these mountains and, and perhaps and hopefully it may make you consider the futility of war. It's um, all live fire at 29 Palms, and so, you know, it, it's tricky to navigate. Um, you can also not ask them to do something again, uh, the way I was able to work with the um, reenactors. Um, but I think as I spent more and more time with them, the um, trainers just sort of gave me more flexibility. Um, they would tell me ahead of time of what was happening. Um, if the weather was not good, I may be able to come back the next day. Um, in the military landscape, you know, everything becomes much more um, emphasized. I think, I think uh, a bit of smoke, um, um, a truck crossing the landscape, you know, um, everything matters and, and um, I found that very provocative. I also love the fact that um, this is the same landscape that Timothy O'Sullivan photographed at the turn of the century when he was doing his survey of the West. And this is my homage to that picture we know very well of the um, horse-drawn um, carriage that he has. Um, so much of war is also waiting, um, even though this is training. You know, you just um, get, hurry up and get ready and then you just sit around and wait forever. And I quickly realized um, that the skirmishes, you know, happen in, in such a short amount of time. And the rest of the time, it's to get organized, to figure out the land, to figure out your gear, to solve all sorts of pro problems you have. Um, and again, you know, the landscape is, is what's really looming and um, overpowering. Um, the night battles there, and I witnessed the last one they had in a really long time because this kind of training became inappropriate um, for the Iraq war. The, the night battles were extraordinary and um, so obscene at the same time. It was the most beautiful, the most sublime thing I've ever experienced. Um, it lasted 20 minutes. Um, they had jets dropping bombs. There were tracers everywhere, howitzers, um, mortars, and then the grunts are in the foxhole firing. And um, I think everyone was either in their tanks or in the foxhole. My sister and I, we each had a camera. We were the only people outside. And we watched this whole thing. And, and the, the power, the amount of power, the devastation is just uh, incredible. But uh, it's also so um, extraordinary. Uh, the tenure of the training quickly changed after that. Um, it became more urban training, and this was right at the beginning of the war, uh, 2004, 2005, and so they grabbed these abandoned officers' housing and just crawled um, all of this graffiti and ideograms on top. And uh, um, it's, it's, um, it's so ironic because uh, so much of the graffiti is, is very telling, and it's like, kill Bush, I go home. Um, and anything you can think of that would be appropriate and with double meanings. Go away. And, and a lot of this work in 29 Palms was re uh, very reminiscent of the back lot of a Hollywood film too. They use the same language as the reenactors. They talk about scenarios. They talk about planning and preparing. Um, and it really made me think about uh, something that perhaps is 
very American in the sense that uh, um, it's a culture that thinks perhaps if you keep training for something, you'll get it right, or if you, um, if something um, that wasn't quite right happened, perhaps if you re reenact it, maybe you could right the wrong. Um, this idea of reenacting the Vietnam War and, and being friendly with the enemy and respect the enemy. Um, as I was finishing 29 Palms, um, um, the Marines who were training there invited me onto um, uh, their next training mission, which is uh, off the coast of California, and they train on these ships because they're part of an expeditionary unit, and this is how they get shipped off to Iraq and Kuwait. Um, and so they said, do you want to come and visit? And I said, sure, why not? And I would say yes. And then I went home and thought about it and, and thought, well, um, you know, as a landscape photographer after the desert, maybe I should look at the ocean. Um, and I, I really didn't think too far. You know, I mean, I knew that the ocean held great mysteries and great fascination for me. I mean, it's a place that um, is, is awesome, but it's, it's also, it fills people with anxiety. Um, that idea of the 19th century exploration across the oceans and across frontiers, um, the idea of borders, uh, all of that was fascinating to me, but I, I um, wasn't quite sure what I would do. And of course, I love Gustave Le Grain. I thought I'd just make pictures of military ships at sea, and that would be the end. Um, so this first trip um, turned into a project that lasted nine years. Um, and it took me to all the continents in the world, um, the Arctic, uh, Antarctic included. Um, I've spent 24 hours in a submarine um, not far from the North Pole. I've been to South Pole Station. Um, it, it was sort of obsessive, um, but I really felt that I needed to see everything. Um, I quickly realized that um, the military, in this age of, of globalism, the military is, is just like one of those corporations, and so it's global, it's everywhere. Um, they try to um, do humanitarian missions. They try to gather information. They try to support science. Of course, they're at war in the Gulf. Um, they also try to train with other nations. And so um, I really wanted to explore all of it. Um, I switched to color because after taking this picture, I quickly realized that, um, and I made the same one in black and white, um, I quickly realized that black and white could not um, express a metal that's cold versus another gray that's warmer, and, and perhaps color would be more appropriate. I also felt that this body of work would not have some kind of um, concept uh, that is either reenactment or training or a landscape that's not what it is. It's unfolding in real time, and it's exactly what it is. And so perhaps it should be in color, and it should be more real. But that creates all other kinds of problems and other challenges, because now suddenly I feel that it brings me so close to photojournalism. So the issue then is how do you distinguish yourself from <coughs> photojournalism and that kind of work? Um, but I think that, uh, that question um, I will answer later. So, so I traveled everywhere. I tried to see as many operations as possible. Um, as I embarked on one ship, I would learn about another, um, another trip and another exploration, and so it just went on and on. Um, after I finished, um, I sort of thought about how I should put everything together, and um, there's so many different locations, so many different types of landscape. It was so confusing. Um, I think what I did was that I just um, started dividing the pictures in types instead of location. And so, for example, here you would have all the types of pictures of ship further at sea um, in different locations. And here you would have the different kinds of trainings. Um, and here the portraits, which I started making. And quickly, it became evident what was repetitive, what was important, um, what was essential. And um, I came up with this idea that perhaps the work should be more of a kind of essay. 
and it would be a sort of travel that would take one um, through the world of the military. In, in this particular case, it was the Navy. Um, and so I'm structuring the last part of the talk um, based on the book and the way the book was constructed and with some excerpts. Um, so the book starts out with, with various landscape that you see um, when you join the military and you start traveling. So here you are in, um, in Panama. Um, this is California. Um, this is in the Bering Sea, Antarctica, Australia, and um, this is the beginning of the book. And here I start introducing the military. Um, and a bit of what um, you know, the aircraft carrier is the main uh, platform of the military. Um, it, it's kind of like their floating bases. And there's so few American st uh, stationary landlocked American bases anymore that they really depend on these aircraft carriers. Um, and this is a bit of the, um, what they do. Um, I think the, the, the main function of an aircraft carrier is to support these um, fighter jets that go out to gather intelligence to drop bombs. And um, they mostly function in the Gulf to support the troops uh, fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's actually um, a four panel picture. Um, this is what they do every morning before um, flight ops happen. Um, all of the um, people working on the deck sort of line up and walk up and down the flight decks to look for small pieces of metal that um, may be strayed and, and would get sucked up into um, uh, a jet and, and would destroy um, a couple of million dollar jet. And so they do this um, every morning. It's called a, a FOD walk, foreign object uh, detection. Um, and, and this next picture is the same thing that I made much earlier, um, I think in 2005. And this one is a more recent one from perhaps 2010. And I try to do this every time I am on an aircraft carrier. And the reason why I'm showing this is, is this whole idea of uh, what's the difference between um, photojournalism or perhaps a, a picture of an aircraft carrier that you would see in National Geographic and what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I think. Um, and and I, I really respect what uh, photojournalists do and what travel photographers do, um, but would have different uh, objectives. Uh, I think this picture sort of captures um, something else that, that has nothing to do with the um, fact of looking for these metal objects, and, and it's, it's about these young men and women kind of lining up and becoming the horizon. And if you look at the, it's a huge print, and you can really see the details and the individuality um, in the faces and in their body language as you get close. And so it's been kind of reduced to sort of this essence of um, a kind of human endeavor on um, this aircraft carrier versus just the idea of the fog walk. Um, and a bit more of, this is one of the more action-packed picture um, on the flight deck. And um, I, I think just a note um, before we move into the first chapter of the book that um, um, it's fiction, or maybe it's still in the movies. You know, you have this uh, huge searchlight on the side that for me um, echoes um, the set of a Hollywood film perhaps. And um, he's looking out at the sea, and, and if you overlook the guns, he could just be um, a passenger on um, a cruise ship looking out. And so this idea of um, there's a fine line between, um, I think, all of the various worlds that I've been exploring. Uh, and this is the first chapter. And the first chapter is about the, the military then um, um, encountering, entering um, other countries and encountering other cultures. And this is what uh, the Navy does, and it's, it's, it's called manning the rail, and it's like a formal presentation. And this is in Indonesia. Um, this is Haiti. And this is right after the earthquake in 2010, I think. I, I can't remember exactly. And the American Navy, with the only forces that could muster the power to bring ships and bring supplies very quickly, 
to Haiti to help um, evacuate people and bring water and uh, evacuate um, and take care of the wounded. Um, for me, this picture is important because there's a really fine line here between coming and helping, this idea of international aid and perhaps the idea of um, invading a country. So um, when you have two cultures colliding, whether it's the military world or the civilian world or uh, a greater nation, larger nation like the United States or smaller nations or imperialism versus um, inter international aid, the, the line is really fine and it's the way these worlds collide that interests me more than actually just describing um, various operations and actions. Um, I also think that um, Americans are, um, American men are the only ones who physically, um, American soldiers behave like this, this idea of feeling so comfortable and filling the space and these guys just arrive a few days before I did and, and they behave like they, they belong there and it's their space. Um, and here are some details. Um, I think the idea of human endeavor within a greater landscape that is very sublime, uh, the idea of order and disorder, and this is a two panel, and these are some details. Um, the Marine Corps in Australia. And I'm always interested in pictures that are much more ambiguous. Um, of course, this, um, the leader of this village is not um, striking his fist you know, with the gesture of black power. He's just pointing at something, but that's what I was interested in. And I love the fact that all these American um, Marine Corps who are actually there and supporting them and have all these great powers sitting down and looking at him and, and he's uh, the overwhelming force, and that was interesting to me to upend that, our, our notions and our preconceptions. And, and I think a lot of the pictures are about that. Um, they are about defying expectations. And here are some details. Um, there's some kind of exchange that happens um, often when um, the Marines travel to various countries to develop relationships. Um, I love the fact that these guys just got hit. Um, Grown men with toys. Um, and this is uh, one of the, um, uh, this is Admiral uh, Tyson. She, until very recently, was one of the um, women highest in command in an operational job, and she's amazing. And she's with her counterpart, um, who's Thai. And they are on a Thai aircraft carrier, and it looks like uh, Martha Stewart came and, and decorated the whole place. So. Um, and the second chapter is, is more about the workings of the ship and uh, um, Robert McNamara, the um, uh, Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, um, coined the word the fog of war and he talks about how you're so steeped in the policy, you're so steeped in making sure everything works that you don't really see the big picture and, and I think um, um, this diptych is very evocative of what he's trying to explain. Um, but in spite of the fog of war, uh, you have to keep things going and, 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 and the day-to-day -day activities on the ship, um, whether it's resupplying, whether it's uh, cleaning the ship, um, is, is just constant. And I wanted to, to try to explain that and I think I think people are, you know, the military is such a strange topic. It, it, um, it ma makes people suspect, it, 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 it makes people paranoid, um, it, it riles people up and, and some people feel very patriotic about it, some people feel uh, so suspect of it. And so I wanted to really see what it looks like and show what it looks like and the cleaning of the ship. Um, I photographed a lot of women because I, um, and the pictures work, and I'm not a portrait photographer. I think they work because I was so interested in um, how competent they are and how they manage to kind of forge their own individuality within this world that is so structured and so male-dominated. 
and some of them try to be one of the guys, like Grace here. Um, and some manage to find the tight-fitting shirt and pluck their eyebrows and, and look so um, attractive and feminine. And she is, um, I love the A. Um, it's, uh, it means that she's in charge of the arresting gear on an aircraft carrier. It's not a Scarlet A. Um, and then this very young woman who, is, who just joined, and she's kind of at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, <clears throat> pictures that also work for me are the ones that um, uh, speak a lot about what's not in the frame. Um, and as much as you know from the reenactors and from working with the view cameras, you know, you often have to direct, you often have to set pictures up. Uh, this is one of those pictures where it was exactly the way I saw it and, and, and um, I could not have imagined it in any better ways and here are some details. Um, I could not have directed these guys and, 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 and sometimes it's just a gift from nature. Um, you know, he's giving a blow job and that's, uh, and in the middle, you know, it, it replicates the exact, uh, you know, I, I mean, I couldn't have planned this any better. And, and of course, um, my daughter's not really listening. <laughs> um, and of course, the, 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 the skies uh, overwhelming the whole um, um, situation. And this is a, a target practice. And of course, I photographed them shooting. Um, and this is maybe the fifth time that I've photo photographed uh, you know, this kind of activity. And it really becomes not about the shooting, but it's about something else. And again, it's, it's, it's uh, when you get past the photographing of the action, the, the objective aspect of the picture, when you get into the subjective part, I think that's when um, it becomes really interesting. Because we all could imagine what it's like to practice target shooting. Um, the third chapter is kind of a, a, a rogue chapter, and it's, I fitted all of the um, Antarctic and Greenland and Arctic pictures in there, and it's um, that sense of being in a, in a world with no frontiers and, and kind of uncolonized, and, and the military does manage to get on this part. Uh, this is South Pole Station, and it's interesting for me that Antarctica is the only continent in the world where there's never been a war, and all these countries have signed uh, a treaty um, to not do any kind of um, uh, nuclear testing, to uh, try to preserve the environment, and to not wage any war. And, and quite a lot of countries have signed that, that treaty. Um, this is the submarine that I went on, um, and this is uh, in the um, Arctic seas. Uh, this is South Pole Station again. And it's incredible that we are everywhere and we've colonized every single square meters of the world, pretty much. Um, these guys are bow, uh, have bow and arrows and they're scientists actually working on tagging these uh, walruses. And they're supported by uh, the Coast Guard on a mission in, um, in the Bering Sea. Um, and then that idea of the 19th century um, of um, the scientists kind of sending off the ship going on an exploration. And the fourth chapters are sort of um, all of these pictures that make you question everything that you've seen or um, hopefully start um, um, making you think about the, mi the military at large. And, and, and um, I mean, I'm interested in, in looking at um, their best attempts, but I'm also interested in uh, looking at the worst blunders. Um, land art again. Um, this is um, um, a five-part piece, and it's um, an aircraft carrier crossing uh, the Suez Canal. And um, I was so interested in the coming together of the military culture with the ancient uh, culture in the background. And I turned it into a five-piece to, to show um, the passage of time and uh, the continuity between uh, the two cultures and the clashing of the two cultures. And so it's the same point of view. Um, the ship is moving and it's so flat and the canal is so narrow that you don't see the water from certain points of view. 
and I was so interested in, in um, that perspective and, and that play. <coughs> Um, we're talking about a voyage, and um, I think we forget in this age of um, uh, air travel what it's like to travel on a ship and, and coming into a new country, coming into a new port, and how you slowly um, get ready for it. And uh, there's a band there to welcome you, and there's a band there to send you off, and it's a very emotional um, arrival, and it's a very emotional departure. There are a lot of strange things that go on also. There are all these guys in the most bizarre place, and this is in Comoros, and they belong to the Navy, and they're part of the Civil Affairs Service, and they are there to teach English, and they're there to um, help in the harbor, and uh, it, it's all very strange. I think they're all CIA, um, or some sort of um, intelligence gathering, and so I wanted to photograph them too. Um, you know, we're back in Vietnam now, uh, so it, it's kind of a slowly closing of the loop. Um, the Americans are communicating with the worst enemy. Um, they actually formally started their first training, and uh, the Vietnamese asked the, the sailors to be in, in formal dress whites whenever they go into town, which is very strange, but the Navy accepted. But it was uh, an opportunity for me, so I set up this picture, of course, which is, um, echoes um, what happened in, during the Vietnam War. Um, this is on a hospital ship. The Navy has two hospital ships, and uh, one was sent to Vietnam, and it goes there regularly to perform uh, these sort of medical missions, uh, short, simple um, cataract operations and other kinds of surgeries. Um, and it's, it's kind of a win hearts and minds uh, situation. Um, I saw the nun getting into the um, waiting room, I mean, I actually saw her on the small boat coming up onto the hospital ship, and I sort of followed her and, and uh, uh, photographed her and then um, kind of created this whole situation when I asked my escort to sit down, and he's actually a Buddhist too. Um, for me, this picture is the play between the objective and the subjective, and, and um, it's, it's that tension. It's when one supersedes the other um, that um, makes the picture most... Uh, challenging and, and most satisfying um, and also provocative. You know, they both um, represent such opposite things. Um, she's a Buddhist nun and he's part of the military. They both wear uniforms, they both have shaved heads, but they are at polar opposites and they represent such opposite things. Um, but they're together in this room. Um, the Navy is very careful about its uh, um, this, its appearance and, and, and creating a, a particular image and, and this, this uh, speaks to that. And this is in the portrait studio in the belly of an aircraft carrier. And I love showing, you know, what's underneath the, um, the, the formal um, jacket and, and wearing the wrong kinds of pants and then the fake clouds and the backdrops. Um, Going back to the role of women, um, I was also interested in the pageantry that comes with the uniform, that comes with uh, um, belonging to a structure and projecting authority. And this must have been really strange for these Vietnamese um, uh, officers having to um, relate to a, um, a female captain. She's the captain of the ship. Um, here again, the single woman translator amongst um, many Indonesians, and this is a training in Hawaii that happens every two years that um, the United States organizes. And this is a detail. Um, the idea of the military, again, um, interacting with uh, civilians, and this is on the island of Comoros. And again, you know, the body language is just uh, so telling. I, I don't think that you would see um, uh, this kind of body language and this kind of owning of the space in many other um, 
cultures. And the three uh, young men are Seabees. They are the um, mobile naval construction unit of the Navy. Uh, this is Guantanamo. And they are, um, I think, a transit um, camp that was set up right after the um, Haiti earthquake. And this is the um, uh, where a lot of the lawyers and these um, civil rights and human rights uh, lawyers stay when they come. They used to come uh, to assist and to be present at the um, um, procedures for the um, prisoners of war. And it's called Camp Justice, of course, though. Um, and this is one of the last pictures I made right before I finish, uh, as I finish this book. Um, this is in Norfolk, and um, it's simply just um, uh, the um, explosive ordnance unit um, training um, some kind of scenario about discovering um, biohazard lab. Um, I was extremely frustrated. Um, I couldn't go down the tunnel and photograph what was inside. They said I could only be on the outside, and uh, um, I decided to make a picture anyway uh, without knowing that uh, I would get this kind of result. And so you, suddenly you have now this mythical creature with three legs, uh, some kind of minotaur um, in a menacing mask. But I, I thought it was very metaphorical um, for the end of this book. And as some kind of uh, prescient um, message about uh, this entire endeavor. And, and again, that idea of power and fragility are the themes that I try to um, address within the same picture using scale. Um, this is an enormous um, ship. It's, um, uh, it's a tanker that's been converted to hospital ship, and it's huge. And I chose to photograph it from further away, kind of drifting off um, to, to speak about power and fragility. Um, and a bit of religion, you know, this is uh, the Chapel of the Snow. It's the southernest church that one finds. It's in Antarctica. Um, this is a woman um, guarding one of the oil platforms during the Iraq war off the coast of Iraq. And she's looking at these um, sailors returning to Vietnam for the first time. And again, that idea of the closing of the loop and that perhaps uh, history repeats itself, um, the Americans are back in Vietnam. Um, so I don't know what else to say. Um, I guess I, I, I should say, I think, you know, because there's so many students here, when I went to school, some of the issues, and this is in the early 1990s um, at Yale, the issues were, well, are your pictures set up or not set up? Uh, what, what kind of ideas are you engaging in? Are you photographing in color or not in color? You know, it, it, it was that kind of, um, does it matter? And, and, and I think, in the end, um, it doesn't matter, and it still doesn't matter. I mean, I feel that um, I am a photographer, and I think that this last body of work, even though it's created challenges, and I think it's made me anxious because it's so close to what just plain documentary photography is, but I think at the same time, it's the purest kind of photography that one, that I feel that I could do, um, but it speaks to me as an artist, and it speaks to me as an artist because I think it's very personal. Um, it comes from, from who I've been and, and what I've lived through, and, and it has a particular affection for the military, but I think it also raises uh, questions and doubts about uh, um, the military presence. Um, I think that it's important that it takes place in the real world because I don't really want um, that work to be thought of as a fantasy. Um, I think it has to unfold in the real world. Um, I always think that it's important that whether the work is personal or not, it needs to transcend that specificity so that it's, it's more, it has more impact and it can 
speak and be more um, um, accessible to, 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 to more people. And, and so I think it's something that I think about a lot. Um, I think at this point I, 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 I'm making watercolors. I'm, 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 I'm thinking maybe I should show a picture that's from the reenactment from, with a picture that is from um, the film set and, and maybe I'll direct my own film. Um, so to go back to this kind of division of subject and topics and types of work and precepts and concepts, it seems to me that it's all very porous and it all kind of um, feeds into each other. Um, but I, I, I love the image and I, I feel that uh, there's really great strength in being able to talk about complicated subject matters with mostly images and, and simple titles. And, and I think different people approach things in different ways. Um, I'm interested in, in, in limiting myself to that. And I'm interested in really being there and experiencing whatever it is I'm interested in and kind of speak truth to power and, and bringing that experience back and kind of filtering it and, and uh, producing these images. Um, so I hope you have some questions. I'd be happy to answer um, anything. I actually shot some 35 millimeter film a, a while back and maybe we, I could show that while we answer some questions. There's a question. Of Hi, um, I just have a question. Um, for realizing this work, you probably have to uh, ask the government or the military for a lot of permission and a lot of, um, I don't know, maybe for, for grants or something. Um, I, w I would be interested in how is the government, um, how important is censorship, for example, or um, involvement of the government or uh, the military itself? Well, um, for sure, I mean, it, it, it required a lot of funding and I, I have to say, I sort of dug myself deep uh, in debts and, and whatever work I sold, um, I would invest it back in here. Um, I think a, co a couple of projects came towards the end that sort of saved my life. And, uh, but in terms of the access, um, they never really, except for Guantanamo, they never really looked at the pictures because um, I don't know. I don't know why. You know, um, I think for the Twenty Nine Palms work, I dealt with the local public affairs office and sort of gained his trust and explained what I was doing. And perhaps because I was Vietnamese and he loved my stories, he kept letting me come and. and you know, I mean, it's a burden for um, that office to have somebody come. They, they would have, <laughs> oops, sorry. They usually would have a, a crew from, I don't know, CBS come to, to view one training session, but I would want to come back, you know, every day for a week. And then, you know, a couple of months later. And so it was really a burden on them. And I, I have to say, I don't know. Um, for the color work, um, I had to ask uh, permission from the Navy Office of Information, and I had to put in a formal request, and that, that took a lot of work. Um, and um, they, they sort of ratified my project, but then every time I had to go on a ship or a new um, trip, I would have to contact the local public affairs again and ask for permission, so it was a real headache. Um, but I, I think if you look at that um, series that was on PBS on the aircraft carrier, I think it was called Carrier, um, the Navy actually let a crew of cameramen of live on the ship for six months. And I think that they were on the verge of saying no, and then they decided to say yes. And I think when they saw the results, they thought it was disastrous because there were footage of a sailor calling home and his wife breaking up with him and people having nervous breakdowns and uh, um, all this crazy stuff that was going on. And they thought, oh my God, we don't really want the world to see that, you know, it's too messy, a life on an aircraft carrier. But in the end, it really showed that 
life was real and it really did not affect the rate of uh, the, the recruiting rate. And so they, they feel that sometimes you show something real that perhaps um, it's, it's to the advantage. And, and they do want the publicity, you know, they don't really want to be um, seen as some kind of secretive um, structure. So I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, censorship um, or access, um, it's, it's a weird question. I think, I think the work is interesting beside, uh, in spite of the access, you know, I don't think people ask, um, um, I mean, am I indebted to them because they let me on the ship and I work so hard? Uh, I don't think so. But I, I certainly changed my opinion about uh, the members of the military, you know, once I started spending more time with them. Uh, I think when I first began working, I didn't quite understand why anyone would want to join the military. And then I quickly realized they do it for economic reasons, they do it for some of them grew up wanting to be in combatant forces, but they sort of checked out their decision-making uh, rights, you know, when they joined. And, and then they just sort of follow, and, and whether they agree with what is being done or not, they just sort of follow because that, that was the deal. Um, but it doesn't mean that um, some of them are not incredible people and, and um, you know, I develop quite a bit of empathy for individual uh, members. Um, but I, I don't think that anyone asks Nan Golden, you know, are you, you know, are you indebted to your friends or, or do you show them in a particular way that's not quite right? Or um, Larry Clark when he photographed um, his circle of um, druggy friends, you know. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about um, <laughs> sort of, I, I'm interested in the earlier work, the reenactment and the film set, and I'm wondering in what ways um, this sort of like involvement of a fictionalized idea of war, or how you consider that in relation to this very like real, um, sort of systems of war and like what kind of similarities or differences come from that understanding and how the photographic image sort of flattens the differences or sort of conflates them together? Um, that's a really interesting question. Well, I think the camera does something uh, working with a view camera. I think um, it's obvious that Sometimes, you know, you take a spontaneous picture, but um, it requires a kind of working, it requires a kind of preconception um, that somehow, I think, unifies the different subject matters um, and, unif and, and I think draws the color work with the other work. Um, and perhaps, you know, the, the Navy is not out um, in the color work out there, training all the time, and, and there's some real action. But um, I think there's a distance also in the way they perform everything. Um, we're not talking about the, um, the Marine Corps going into the field, going into battle. So it's still behind the line. And I think in that way, it, it um, unifies the, the different topics. And, and I think, to be honest, um, it's all fiction for me. Um, they're all facts that I've picked together, that I've strung together. Um, so maybe the color work looks more real, um, but it's not. I, I think it's all fiction. So this idea of skirting the fine line between fiction and reality is, is, is not, not really, uh, doesn't make sense for me. It's all fiction. Um, I mean, I think it's just like a fiction writer or writers string to, st stringing together words and, and, and uh, creating a sentence and writing a story. Um, for me, it's all the same. Um, my question was gonna be somewhat similar to the first, um, the first one, but I'm gonna go a little bit farther with it because you know you had mentioned um, in one of your photos about how the military is very self-conscious about the kind of image that they put out. So it begs the question that what 
control did they have in the ultimate final scene of the project? Did they have any, um, no. yeah, any kind of? No, nothing. I think the only time they really controlled anything was when I was in Guantanamo and then also on the oil platform. I think they were very careful about maybe not showing one gun in relationship to something else because strategically um, they felt that it would give away something about the security. But then, you know, I explained to them more, these are view camera pictures, it's not digital. You know, this is, I'm not going to post them on Instagram. And back then, Instagram didn't even exist. This is in 2007 or something like that. Um, but for Guantanamo, there was someone looking through my viewfinder every single time I made a picture. Um, again, a question of strategy, but otherwise, no. They never really looked at anything. They felt that, um, um, that they were not showing me anything that they didn't want me to see. So, um, so yeah. And I think I was nervous at times inviting them to exhibitions I've had. And I've had exhibitions um, at different times before I finished a project. And I was never quite happy with the exhibitions because I felt that it only showed perhaps one aspect of this big topic. And I felt the book itself is multifaceted enough that it showed the subject of the Navy or this particular, my view of the Navy in all its facets. Um, but I've invited them a few times and very nervous about their response. But I, I felt I had to because you know, over nine years, I think I've out, um, uh, what's the word, uh, I've outrun, I think, three or four public affairs offices. They, they rotate every three years. And I, I, by the time I got to my fourth public affairs office, they said, so what are you doing? What is this book? You know, why we keep saying yes? So I started having to invite them to see the shows. And, and they said, well, that blonde chair, why didn't you, why didn't somebody move that? Or, uh, you know, they, they would notice little things that they wanted to rearrange. And I try to explain, well, I'm interested in this relationship between domesticity and uh, the military and power. And they say, oh, OK. Interesting. One, one last thing. As a socially engaged uh, photographer myself, uh, photo-based artist, I sometimes get so involved with my subject matter that is highly charged that sometimes I forget what's my objective and what, I, what, what my objective yes. is. So, so, because I get so involved, like in, a so, in something that's so highly charged, like you said, military is quite a highly charged, right? You, people have very strong feelings one way or the other. It's not a subject that's just, oh, okay, <laughs> you know? And especially American military, right? It's like the largest in the world. But, um, and I find myself, when I'm involved in my projects that are very politically charged, I sometimes get lost in what I'm doing. I'm wondering if you ever, get so immersed in what you're doing that you kind of have to go like, and I was seeing that maybe in the reenactment that would happen more, where you'd say, well, okay, hold on, what am I doing here? What's my, what's my role? What's my objective? Did, did you ever experience that, like a sort of a loosing of the boundaries of where, where your art started and where your role was? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but I have, um, I have great, very smart friends that I consult regularly and my husband is one of them. Uh, and they kind of keep me on track. Um, but yes, it's very easy to, to get lost. And I think for me, it was very easy to get lost on wanting to go back on the aircraft carrier one more time because I loved landing with the hook, you know, going from 200 miles per hour to zero miles per hour in three seconds, you know, uh, who wouldn't want to do that? So um, yeah, you get lost and you get um, carried away and, um, as much as you think a picture is great because you love meeting that person or you love that situation, and then someone else would say, well, but the picture is not good. You know, so it's that same. It, that's, it, you, you just have to be, you know, hardcore, blunt, and, and unemotional. Um, and I think someone else would do it better than you. So you just have to get those people to help you out. Just got one last question right here. Thanks so much for uh, showing us your great work. It's over here. Yes. <laughs> I was going to start the other oh, film, okay. which is really good. And uh, oh, I, I heard you say a couple of times, uh, you mentioned the word watercolor. And so yes. I was just thinking, well, would you care to elaborate a little bit or to talk about what you're doing? 
Um, this short film got me started on making portraits or made me realize that I should try to make portraits. Um, watercolors, yes, so the, um, so that short, you know, it's about tra trying to transform something and um, I suppose I could I, scan those film stills and degrade them and reprint them, but I'm in interested in labor. And, uh, and, and to be honest, I have no skills. You know, I, I, I did not learn how to draw. I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to paint. I don't know anything. But I'm, I was interested in the labor, and I felt that perhaps I could learn it. And maybe in the awkwardness and uh, in, in my lack of um, skills, perhaps something could come about. And I thought it could be a nice way to uh, transform those film stills. And I think, of course, the um, uh, the next step would be to go on one of those sets, and, and, and I am actually thinking about that. Um, and I think that it's actually a real genre, this idea of the fetish of the uniform um, in porn, and straight and gay porn, yes. Okay, um, I think we should probably wrap it up now, so if anyone has other questions for Anne Mee, maybe they can ask her at the reception. So thanks again for your talk. <laughs>